In the next few videos, we're going to cover the endocrine system. This video is going to cover glands as well as the different types of hormones. So first of all, glands are organs that synthesize substances for release. There are two different types of glands, endocrine glands and exocrine glands. We're going to spend a lot more time discussing the endocrine glands since we are going over the endocrine system. However, it is important for you to know about the exocrine glands so that way you're able to distinguish between endocrine and exocrine glands and so you can also understand the importance of exocrine glands in physiology. Now, the main distinction between endocrine glands and exocrine glands is where they secrete their substances. So endocrine glands release hormones into the bloodstream, whereas exocrine glands release various substances onto an epithelial surface. So let's take a look at a few examples. For endocrine glands, we have the pancreas. The pancreas secretes insulin and glucagon into the bloodstream to help regulate blood glucose concentrations. The thyroid gland releases thyroid hormones that regulates basal metabolic rate. The parathyroid glands, they secrete parathyroid hormone, which helps to regulate blood calcium concentrations. We also have the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. We're going to spend an entire video covering these two because they secrete a variety of different hormones that are important for physiology. We also have the ovaries and testes that of course are going to be secreting hormones that are important for reproductive processes. Exocrine glands, again, these are glands that secrete substances onto an epithelial surface. Now, when you think of an epithelial surface, you usually think of the skin, and that's certainly the case for some of these exocrine glands like sweat glands as well as sebaceous glands that secrete sweat and oil on the surface of the skin. However, epithelial surfaces can also include different tracts within the body. So an example is the gastrointestinal tract. So you have the pancreas that secretes digestive enzymes into the GI tract, the epithelial surface of the GI tract. You also have the prostate gland that secretes a component of semen that passes through the urinary tract in males. And you also have the salivary gland that secretes saliva in the mouth, that's part of the GI tract. And of course, you also have the gastric glands that secrete acid, pepsinogen, mucus into the stomach, another component of the GI tract. And another example are the mammary glands that secrete milk, and of course, those are released on the surface of skin. And if you're paying attention, you'll actually notice I mentioned one gland in both endocrine and exocrine, and that is the pancreas. So the pancreas is really a unique organ, and as you can see in this diagram, the pancreas has both an endocrine role and an exocrine role in physiology. So there are some cells in the pancreas that will secrete hormones, insulin, and glucagon into the bloodstream. There are also different cells in the pancreas that have an exocrine role and secrete digestive enzymes through the pancreatic duct into the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, so now that we understand the difference between endocrine and exocrine glands, let's talk about hormones. We said that endocrine glands secrete hormones into the bloodstream. What are hormones? Hormones are signaling molecules released in the blood that regulate physiology and behavior. And as I went through several of these examples, you saw how these different hormones can regulate physiology and behavior. In terms of these hormones, we can classify them as one of three types. Peptide hormones, steroid hormones, and tyrosine derivatives. Often, the distinction is between peptide hormones and steroid hormones, and this is essentially in terms of how the signaling works. And you can see a summary of this on this diagram. Peptide hormones are polar molecules. So since they're polar molecules, they cannot pass through the phospholipid bilayer on cells. So they bind to a cell surface receptor, and this leads to a signal transduction pathway that often leads to the phosphorylation or dephosphorylation of different proteins to produce a result. 
Steroid hormones are nonpolar molecules. They are able to pass through the cell membrane. So they will bind to an intracellular receptor that will ultimately go into the nucleus and modify transcription. Again, this will lead to a change in the cells that produces a response. So the main difference, peptide and steroid hormones is really just the type of receptors they bind to and how they elicit a response. Now, there are some additional differences. So peptide hormones, of course, based on their name, means that they are peptides. They are made of amino acids and they can vary in size. So they can be a few amino acids or they can be many amino acids. So basically some peptide hormones are smaller, some peptide hormones are larger. And as I mentioned, peptide hormones being amino acids, they are polar molecules that bind to cell surface receptors. The cell surface receptors will often drive signaling cascades that involve second messengers. And the idea of these signaling cascades is they allow for amplification. So the binding of a single molecule can result in a large response in a cell. And the other thing is, remember I said that for these cell surface receptors, the signaling cascades often results in the phosphorylation or dephosphorylations of proteins and enzymes within the cell. This will result in a fast effect because the protein is already present and you're basically turning that protein or enzyme on or off. At the same time, even though this effect is fast acting, it also has short lasting effects. So it's not going to last a long time. Steroid hormones, these are derived from cholesterol. And in this diagram, you can see the chemical structure of cholesterol, where the most recognizable portion is the ring structures. So you can see there are three six-membered ring and a five-membered ring. That's very characteristic of cholesterol and a structure you should be able to recognize for the exam. Now, you can also see there are a variety of different hormones that are derived from cholesterol. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and so forth. All right, so again, these steroid hormones are derived from cholesterol. And when you're looking at the structures of these hormones, you can tell that they're largely nonpolar molecules. So they can bind to intracellular receptors either in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus, and that's going to lead to a change in transcription. Now, if you're altering transcription, that means you have to produce new mRNA molecules, and those new mRNA molecules need to be translated into protein products. That takes time, which is why steroid hormones are sort of the opposite of peptide hormones. Peptide hormones are fast acting, but the effects don't last very long. Steroid hormones, they're slow acting. It takes time to synthesize new protein molecules, but once you synthesize them, they're going to last much longer. So the effects are longer lasting, and in some cases, even permanent, when you think about the effects of the reproductive hormones on sexual development. The last type of hormone are the tyrosine derivatives. These are derived from the amino acid tyrosine. There are two different types of tyrosine derived hormones, the thyroid hormones, as well as the catecholamines. Now, often people will just say there are two types of hormone, peptide and steroid, and they won't really talk about this third type of hormone. And the reason why is because the thyroid hormones effectively act like steroid hormones. So they're able to pass through the cell membrane and bind to an intracellular receptor to elicit their effects. The catecholamines, which include epinephrine and norepinephrine, they act like peptide hormones. So they bind to cell surface receptors and their effects like peptide hormones are very fast. So it can take seconds for a fight or flight response to trigger as a response of catecholamines and fight or flight responses often will go away in 10 minutes or so. So sometimes these are lumped in as peptide and steroid hormones, but technically in terms of the structure, they aren't peptides, they're derived from tyrosine, which is just a single amino acid.